Hello, everyone. Today is Wednesday, March 28th. Wednesday? No, it's Thursday. Today's Thursday, March 28th, 2018. This is the week in charts. As usual, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate that from you guys and girls. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. In fact, that's going to be a big part of the show. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep your questions to the slide, just for your slides, for your benefit. And then also for your benefit, hold off on your stock picks till we get the live charts. And I don't have a tremendous amount to cover today, although I do, I am on schedule, so we may have to uh, cut the show a little short, but we should have plenty of time to get to your picks. And then I want to focus this week on using discretion to stick with trades. We had an example from two weeks ago. But I'm just getting around to talking about it. So I want to talk about that. And then with the market becoming a little questionable in here, I think now is the time to really look at the state of the markets. Before we do all that, there's a display on the screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And guess what? A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from my buddy Greg Morris. All right, let's talk about using discretion to stick with trades. Now let's take a look at the example first and then let's begin to pick apart discretion. Here's a stock that we were short, meaning obviously we wanted it to go down. And what happened? Well, unfortunately it rallied up and if memory serves, it went about three cents above the stop. The stop was at 33 right here. And then if you squint your eyes, once I get the red off, if you squint your eyes, you can see that, it, yes, it did technically, on a mechanical basis, hit that stop. And if you're following along mechanically, which I would encourage you to do if you're new to trading or lack discipline, then by all means, let yourself get stopped out and then wait for the next opportunity. However, if you're willing to exercise a little discretion and have a little bit of discipline, then a lot of times a little discretion will really help out your trading longer term. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more detail. And as you can see, it began to implode. So what, what turned into a losing trade would actually be beginnings of and possibly a bigger winner. Now, I'm always nervous about throwing out a discretionary example and maybe that's one week I waited an extra week just because it kind of seems like you're throwing salt in the wounds but you got to realize that markets don't necessarily move on exacts and I'm going to flesh that out in a few minutes here so even though the stop was hit at 33 it's okay to give it a little little wiggle room he tried to say and this is especially true you come in and you can see this market's way up here and your stop is right there. Well, you know on noise alone, there's a pretty good chance that that stop is going to get hit. So you simply, well, you don't carry stops overnight anyway, it provided you are using discretion. But metaphorically, you pull that stop on the open, and if the market begins to implode, you replace the stop above that opening range. And sometimes, not all the time, you avoid a losing trade. Now, your incremental cost, that actual little bit that you give it, is very little compared to the potential to stick with a winning trade. Now, of course, something bad can happen. You can come in the next day and the stock could gap higher and you will feel some regret about not just letting that stock get taken out. But that's that just comes with the game. If you catch just a few big winners, it'll pay for even those discretionary calls that go a little further against you than you would have hoped. Now, keep in mind, again, that markets don't move on exacts, and that's why you have to be willing to use a little bit of discretion. Years ago, I showed a stock that stopped out at nine, and then it went on to like 50 bucks a share. And somebody said, hey, Dave, in that discretion example, the stock stopped out at nine. Why didn't you just place your stop at eight ninety nine? Well, nobody is that perfect. It reminds me of Yogi Berra, 
who said if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. So channeling Yogi, my corollary to that is if markets were perfect, they wouldn't be. So markets don't move on exacts. If they did, whoever had the biggest computer would win the game, but then they would no longer be a game to win. So it's the disagreement of prices or the disequilibrium of prices is what allows us to be profitable and obviously sometimes causes losses. Now, we talked about this last year, and I'm sure you guys have seen this slide before, but I think it's worth mentioning again. Whenever I begin talking about discretion, some tend to confuse or wonder, well, what's the difference between discretion and micromanagement? Well, there's a couple of big differences. Discretion is using your brain to generally improve performance. It's like saying, okay, well, my stop's at nine on this. It's coming in today at about nine dollars and a quarter. It's a good, there's a good chance that this stock on the open at least could go down and hit that stop because it's only like a 25 cent move. Could be noise alone, could be a market maker playing fun and games, could be a fund or something deciding to dump a little to test the waters to see if there's any support below the market. And there are people, institutions and such that go on stop hunts just to flush out, flush out some people before they go in and make their big orders. Now you can't trade directly off of that, but you can, I saw somebody a couple days ago on YouTube making it sound like you can trade on the trade with the institutions by waiting for all these things to happen. And no, you can't necessarily do that. But when you do see it happen in real time around your stop, it's okay to let it unfold, provided, of course, you do have some discipline and you are willing to stop out at a slightly larger level than the stop would have been originally. So discretion is a minor tweak, while not drifting, or minor tweaks, I should say, while not drifting too far away from the core methodology. We still are going to have that stop in place, okay? Let's say our stop is here and the market comes down. We might just say, well, let's just pull the stop on the open. And if this market just goes just below it and takes off again, then we'll put that stop back in. So that's a little minor tweak I'm speaking of. I'm not talking about throwing caution to the wind, letting it go through that stop, and then waiting and waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, way down here, you throw in the towel, and you've lost a tremendous amount of money. So again, it's just a minor tweak. Now, micromanagement, on the other hand, is abandoning the original plan in attempt to outsmart the market. I see it all the time. Hey, Dave, market went up big today. That stock you got us long didn't go up. Something's wrong. I'm going to go ahead and bail out. It's like, well, let's just sit tight and see. And, yeah, we could get stopped at a loss. But following the plan is usually the thing to do. Now, the problem with micromanagement is it can often pay over the short term, but never longer term. So let's say with that aforementioned stock, you decide, well, you know what? Market was up. Stock was not. I'm getting out. Well, next few days, stock implodes. You see that happen two or three times in a row. Well, guess what? Sooner or later, that micromanagement is going to keep you out of a big winner. The big winners are crucial to the methodology. And without the big winners, your performance is going to be mediocre at best. You have to have a way, no matter what your methodology is, you have to have a way to limit your losses while still allowing for the potential for unlimited gains. Now, as I preach ad nauseum, to a point where I'm sick of hearing it and sick of seeing this slide, this picture I should say, the market can be a really bad teacher. So as I just said, two or three times in a row, that micromanager is really going to pay off. But that fourth time, the stock takes off without you. I've seen buyouts happen. I've seen on the short side, stocks implode for that exact. In fact, I can think of a specific example where we were short and somebody the day before said, you know, this stock didn't go down. The market tanked. There's something wrong. I'm getting out. 
And then lo and behold, the following day, they had bad news and the stock literally halved overnight. So on the short side, that was a pretty good trade to be sitting in. Now, with trading, everything becomes a trade-off. So there's a the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to discretion. Obviously, it doesn't always work. You could put yourself into a state of regret on the following days. So let's say that you don't get stopped out because you followed along with I said, oops, let me rewind that. Let's say you don't get stopped out because you followed along with what I said. Let's say that market rallies up, say your stops here. And let me reduce, start that. Let's say your stop is here, the market's here. Okay, Big Dave says, let's pull that stop on the open. And lo and behold, we turned around intraday. We put the stop back in. And now we're sitting pretty. Well, let's say the next day you come in, stock gaps below that, it keeps dropping. Okay. And then you could be into the proverbial deer in the headlights phase at this point. Okay. So it doesn't obviously always work. And then you could put yourself into a state of regret on subsequent days. Also, as I preach ad nauseum, every time you make a decision, you are using emotions. It's impossible to make a decision without emotions. I don't need to go into all the details on that. Just trust me. It's our physiology. So when you put discretion in here, you are making an extra decision with the discretion, but you also could put yourself into a state of regret where you're forced to make additional decisions. So everything has a cost in this benefit. Although I think with discretion, the benefits far outweigh the costs. Over the last couple of years or so, one of my frustrations has been it's been really hard for me to make my trading service work mechanically, like you just saw with the stock last week. And I can give you probably 100 examples over the last several years, maybe not 100, but enough to make, make a big deal, a big difference, I should say. That's one of my frustrations has been it's been really, really hard to make things work mechanically but with a little discretion, things actually worked out okay. So it's hard for me with that beginner or novice trader to say, this is all you have to do, just push a button, get a peanut, because it hasn't worked that well in more recent years. I don't know if the markets have gotten a little choppier. Maybe there's some hidden volatility and some of these momentum issues that we're not seeing or compensating for. But discretion tends to take care of that. Now, again, you got to be careful not to turn into the proverbial deer in the headlights. Now, when I wrote this slide, what I'm referring to is, let's say, your stop's here and the market's here. And it goes through and you're like, okay, well, let me give it a little wiggle room. I've got an uncle point down here. I'm going to get out, no questions asked. And then it goes through that. And then it's like, well, let me just wait, wait, wait. Oh, well, you know what? It's so oversold now. It's bound to bounce. Well, sooner or later, you're going to have to throw in the towel. You can't, again, turn into that proverbial deer in the headlights. So it does take some discipline. Now, what I often tell my people is, let's say that the stock looks like this and closes way down here, okay? And then let's say the stop is like right here. And this is, let's say this is Monday. Well, Monday night, I'll say, guys, look, I'd be willing to, more, I'd be willing to bet that this stock is going to get hit the stop is going to get hit on the open. There's your stop right here. So if you're disciplined, I would suggest you apply a little bit of discretion. So the point here is that you know ahead of time, many, many times, that that stop is going to get hit because the day before, it's really, really close. If you back up to that Pulte example, as I said, the PHM, it was really close to that stop. And you do going into the next day, that there was a better than average chance that it was going to get hit. So it's time for you to wake up and say, hey, wake up. I'm going to have to apply a little bit of discretion. Now, again, when it does work, the longer term gains far outweigh the incremental risk. You can never lose sight of the fact that the game is won longer term by catching longer, longer term winners. As I said a few minutes ago, Without those crucial longer-term winners, your returns are going to be mediocre at best. 
So here's an example I used last year when I was talking about discretion. And what happened was the stock triggered a buy entry. And then our stop, STOP, was down here. And then what's kind of interesting is the stock just went sideways. It didn't really do anything wrong, but it went sideways. And then once again, it nicked the stop. Okay, that's exhibit B of another example. And there's plenty of them. I can go back and find a ton of them, as I said earlier, from the service where the stock just comes down and barely nicks the stop and then takes off. Now, I'm not trying to show you these like the proverbial fish that got away, but rather to say, hey, it's okay to apply a little discretion. Your stop's at nine, let it open. It, I think in this case, it went to like 895 or something like that before it found support and then reversed nicely, both intraday and took off over the next few days. Now, as I've said before, my wife has told me this on more than one occasion, and I've actually had a few clients tell me this too. You're often right, but early. Is there something you can do about that? That's almost a direct quote from my wife. Well, I pride myself in the fact that I'm often right, unfortunately, but early, because it makes me feel like, hey, you know what? At least... It's on my radar. At least I'm in the right stocks or right markets. My time is just maybe a little bit off. But you have to be careful, like Michael Berry from The Big Short. He said, I may have been early, but I'm not wrong. So you got to be careful not to become obstinate, even though you do think that market will eventually go in your favor. Sometimes, you just have to be willing to let yourself get stopped out. Even when you're applying that discretion, that little extra discretion you use, a little extra wide, wide stop, that little extra wide stop, I should say, you have to be willing to let that hit and get out of the way. As I preach, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Now, if you guys haven't seen the big short, I recommend you see it. As I said last time, I was on this slide don't watch it with someone who doesn't understand markets because you'll spend half the movie explaining markets to them because you, you'll feel like they're missing half the movie because they don't understand markets. Or if you're if you are able to be quiet, which I cannot be when I realize people are missing the point, but if you're able to be quiet, what's going to happen is they're going to ask you a bunch of questions and then you're going to miss the movie. So watch it the first time on your own. i got a copy floating around here. It'd be just as easy for you to get your own, though. But anyway, so Michael was losing a lot of money shorting all these, uh, I think it was collateralized mortgages or whatever. And then his big investor comes in and says, you know, Michael's like, I may have been early, but I'm not wrong. And it's like, that's the same thing, Michael. And it can be the same thing, okay, if you're not willing to get out of the way. And one of the small good feelings that I have, I guess, for lack of better words, is when I'm right but early, is that at least it was on my radar. And I know if I keep chipping away at it, I'm going to be right eventually and not too early. And that's one of the hard parts about trading trends, okay, is that that outlier is very important. Those few big winners are really important. Indiscretion is going to help you. Cash shows. So the question is, is there something you can do about that, about being right but early? Well, the topic so far has been on discretion, so obviously discretion. You can set an alarm to let you know that action needs to be taken versus the hard stop. Now, just last week I received an email from somebody, and you might be here today, so I'll give you a shout out. And anyway, she said that I and, uh, I guess I could say it, Charles Kirk, both said use alarms versus hard stops. And as a general statement, I do use alarms versus hard stops, but occasionally I will use hard stops. But you can set an alarm, and if that stock stop gets near, then you know you have to take some action. However, the only problem with that is it takes a lot of discipline to let that stop get hit 
and then make that decision, that extra decision, whether or not to stay with the stock by giving it a little bit marginal risk. And this lady was telling me that her problem is she watches the alarm get triggered. She watches the stock, but it goes against her, goes against her, goes against her, goes against her. And she does become that proverbial deer in the headlights. So we kind of circle back to the fact that it does require discipline and you get discipline over time. And how do you get those reps in? Well, you trade, obviously, but you also trade at a size that's meaningless if you don't have the discipline to where you're not so stressed out about the losses. The other thing that's going to help you tremendously is to watch the open. I would say 90% of discretion will occur there. When I was putting together these slides this morning, I borrowed this from last year's presentation, and I thought I'd put like 99% of discretion in here. So it's, it's, a, it's a big number. I'd say it's somewhere between 90 and 99% of discretion is going to occur on the open. Now, when I say watch the open, I'm not saying sit there for an hour every day after the market opens. A lot of times, I'll just watch the open for 90 seconds or maybe two minutes or so. And if there's no action to be taken, I'll go off and eat some breakfast, take a little break because I get in here about 530 and I work a solid three or four hours, whatever that is, three hours to open. Yeah, three hours. And then I'm ready for a break and I'm getting hungry by that point. So I'll watch the open. And if there's nothing to do, I'll move on. And usually 9 out of 10 or, or maybe even 9.5 out of 10 times, there's really nothing to do. And within a minute or two, I know everything's fine. And then I move on. Now, when you are trading a transitional setup, in other words, an emerging trend, an early trend in a market that looks like this, let's say it's bottoming out for a long, long time, and then beginning to take off, you will quite often be right, but early. But again, you're going to have to be careful not to allow being prudent turned in to turn into being obstinate. So if that market comes down, your stop is here. It's okay to get a little wrong, but if it goes on to make brand new lows, you're wrong. Okay, you might be right, but early, but you're wrong and becoming obstinate. Now, one thing you could do when this occurs is to take a view from 10,000 feet. In other words, see the forest for the trees. If you go back and look at that CRC example, the stop nick was right around here. Well, you have to even squint your eyes. I don't know if you could see that on the drawing, so let me circle it. Okay, right there was the stop nick, and you could barely even see it. And, of course, the stock goes on a double from there. It did quadruple from here. But it would have been really hard to hold on to because it's had some really deep retracements along the way. And that's one thing I'm working on longer term because I know as I get older, I'd like to be more and more detached from my trading. And I'd like to hold these trends, these stocks for a long, long time. So I'm trying to figure out a way to ride out those really big corrections. And that might be a bit of a grail hunt, but it would be kind of cool to move in that direction. The only way I've solved for that so far is to gradually let that stop loosen up and that stop starts looking like a very, very long-term moving average, but I'm working on it. But again, the bottom line is you wanna be able to capture these bigger trends and by getting that big picture view, that forest for the trees or that view from 10,000 feet, you could see that these little bit of stock Nicks aren't really that big of a deal. Now, when you're watching every little tick around the open, it feels like a huge big deal, but it's important to, again, back that chart way out. I had some intraday charts I was going to put in today on these discretionary things, but I decided to not put them in because on a daily chart, it's a lot easier to exercise that discretion. And by that, I mean, let's say your stop is here. And the stock is here and you're watching a daily chart, it's going to look like that, okay, on that nick. But if you're watching that intraday chart, it might look like this and look pretty damn scary. But in reality is, and maybe I didn't draw it quite big enough, it might only look like that on a daily chart. So it's a little bit easier to follow your plan when it looks like this when you're not looking at that macro. But again, getting back to the slide, 
take a big picture view. And what are we trying to do here? Well, we're trying to capture, in that particular case, a major, major bottom in an oil stock that used to be $90 a share. And now I think it's $50 a share. So it's on its way back to 90. And that was the ultimate goal is, hey, let's get in down here around eight, nine bucks a share, 10 bucks a share, and let's ride it all the way back to its old highs, okay? Well, obviously, we got stopped out before that happened. Even if you did apply discretion, it was a big correction in between. But that was a pretty good run until that happened. And by the way, as I said earlier, this is the problem I'm up against with the service, at least, of the last couple of years, is that we're ripe and early in a lot of these moves, but it's required a lot of discretion to stick with them. And I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. In this case, in the Pulte case, it was only a few cents that made all the difference in the world. All right, any question on exercising discretion? Any comments? Any of you guys and girls have problem following along or anything along those lines? All right, quiet bunch today. My poor nephew, I wish he was local because I would, uh, I'd, I'd get him in here with me. But he lives about eight hours away. He's been cursed with graduating with a degree in finance. <laughs> and I've been slowly deprogramming him. And I'm trying to get him back to just forgetting everything he learned and going just look at one chart, one pattern, I should say, one setup and following that one setup. But anyway, long story endless, I get a text from him yesterday. He's going through a bit of a drawdown, had a few stocks stop out, as have I. It's, it hasn't been a great market lately. And he's like, what about the trade wars? Like, what are my thoughts on the trade wars? And I had forgotten there was a trade wars or a trade war. And it just reminds me of the what about the situation in Nigeria? Well, the point there is there's always something to worry about. I know I've told the story a thousand times, and I'll probably tell a thousand more, but I was at Traders Expo, and I showed all these great shorts in the energy stocks that we were short in the open portfolio, and then somebody just blurts out, what about the situation in Nigeria? Well, I didn't know there was a situation in Nigeria, but this gentleman who was very smart was pointing out there's a situation in Nigeria and possibly Venezuela too, where oil prices could be driven up. And here I am talking about shorting stocks. Well, my point is don't confuse the issue with facts. In this particular case, not all cases, sometimes news will burn you. I've gotten burned many a times on news. But for the most part, you want to ignore news because you really can't factor it in to your trading. If I think if you had to factor it in, if I was forced to use news, put a gun to my head, I would fade the news. I would do just the opposite of what the news would suggest. So with the situation in Nigeria, meaning oil prices going higher, I would short oil. And the reason I would is because that's going to, that news event is going to put the most amount of people on the wrong side of the market. They're going to be applying the logic to their trades. As I often say, they're going to be confusing the issue with facts. By accident, I found this slide from the trading psychology course I've been working on on and off for the last couple of years. But it makes a lot of sense. And now's the time where we need to wrap our head around this type of thinking. And as you know, you'll always get something good. you always get something good from Jesse Livermore. Not even a world war can keep the stock market from being a bull market when conditions are bullish. Or a bear market when conditions are bearish. And all a man needs to know to make money is to appraise conditions. Well, the next segment of this show, we're going to appraise the conditions. So do the trade wars matter? Eh, maybe. Shorter term, looks like the market's freaking out a little bit over them. But longer term, this might just be a little blip in the road and impossible to detect on a chart. Now, I've seen a few people do this before. One in particular, or more memorable, I should say, was Greg Morris. It's like he'll throws up a stock, and he says, "Can you point out 9/11 long-term capital management?" Which most of you probably aren't old enough to remember, 
but it's important to understand that these things do happen in markets and a host of other events. And you would be very hard pressed to figure out where those events occurred in the chart. He also talked about the, I forget how many earning periods. Let me just pick a number out of the air, uh, 30 earning periods. And if you could pick out in a chart where you think there was an earning period and figure that out, were the earnings good earnings or bad earnings? So he makes a really good case against news. I hate covering a position at the open or during lunch. I'll use discretion. The close, if at highs for shorts or lows, cover, no discretion at the close. Yeah, at the close, the one thing about the close is, and that's why I do have, and I, do, I used to do have a lot more of them back in the day. But right now, I have one or two market on close systems with IPOs because you're going to have that more liquidity on the close. Now, it's often said that the open is amateur hour, and some people often say, hey, Dave, what if I don't trade the first half hour a day? Well, the pro of the day, the problem with that is that stock might make its biggest move in that first hour of the day. So unfortunately, we're forced to trade the open sometimes. But yes, most of your discretion, most of your fun and games will come on the open. You'll find a lot of times institutions, let's say they want to buy a stock, they might jam it down on the open so people will sell out and then they'll come in and bring the stock higher. Longer term, if you think about it, that's kind of how a trend knockout works or why a trend knockout works because you're in a longer term trend, the market is a sharp sell off, a lot of people panic and exit. So that selling is taken out of the market. And obviously if you get caught in that selling, it'll take you out with you. But if you wait to get in after that correction, a lot of times you can do really well. All right, let's talk about the state of the markets. Now, one thing that has amazed me over the years is in making things more and more and more and more and more simple is that there are little tiny rules that make a heck of a lot of sense and are very easy to follow, such as you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. You can't have a bear market without sell signals, okay? Unfortunately, not every sell signal, whether it's Dave Light or bow ties or first thrusts, etc., will turn into the mother of all bear markets. But you have to, as Greg Morris says, treat every signal as if it will become the big one. Now, getting back to Dave Light, this is a graphic I've showed quite often in the new version of Metastock they've including my they have included my indicators which few indicators I have and setups such as trend knockouts and bow ties and then they've also included getting back to indicators Dave light and that's just simply the lows are greater than the moving average and what I had them program in was a count to where every day the low is greater than the moving average, I want you to increase the count. So this does not tell me the magnitude. This does not tell me how far away the distance from the moving average. It's just a binary decision. Is it above the moving average? Yes. Add once the previous day's score. Okay. Is it less than the moving average? Within well, score that is downside daylight and the count starts over. If it touches the moving average, then the count starts over too. So just walking you through this, you could notice that I've highlighted all the upside daylight, Dave Light, I should say. Now we did have a couple of weeks of downside Dave Light here where the market dipped below the, and by the way, this is the 50 week moving average. I find the 50 week moving average works, works really well in the longer term chart. Maybe that would be a 250 day moving average, I think, on a daily. 
I think that's right. And anyway, but you can see in 2000, I don't know if you read my chart down here, we had what happened, a bear market. Well, look at this. The bear market, we had downside day light for the entire bear market and not one week of upside day light. Now, what happened in 2003? Well, if you've been around for a while, you know the market bottomed out. It began to rally. We did have a couple of periods where it went red, but it was very minuscule compared to the amount of green time. Now, what happened at the end of 2007? Well, we started getting, believe it or not, at the end of 2007, we started to see the beginnings of Dave Light. Now, it doesn't mean that you rush out and sell the form, but you might want to have it appraised when you start seeing some red in that Dave Light. Okay, so the 2007 bear market, you had red the entire way. Then what happens? Well, we turned around, we started going back up. Now, there was some lag here, okay? But if on a daily chart, by the way, if you come in here on a daily chart, there were a lot of great buy signals back in March of 2000, if you guys remember, in nine. And then what happened? Well, we've had mostly green since. We had a couple of weeks of downside day light, but it really didn't break down from that level. And you can see it's flagged here. And then mostly we've had upside day light since. And again, in 2011, there was a little bit of red, but it didn't materialize. And then we had that great bull run coming in 2015. Now, and 2000, late 2015 and 2016, it did get a little ugly in here for a while. And I was stopped out of all my longs, and I started putting on some shorts. And I actually made a little bit of money, not much, but a little bit of money on the short side doing that slide. Well, it would later turn out to just be a big correction in the long term market. But at that time, I didn't know that. And by the way, as I think Judge Dotery said in Greg's book, or Greg Morris quoted, Judge Dotery's from Stadium Capital Management, back when Greg used to run, I don't know, $8 billion over there, $5 billion, $8 billion, $6 billion, I forget how many. But anyway, anyone who has kept pace with the market as a fund manager he's referring to should be questioned because, yeah, if you bought way back here, and, you know, you're up here, you got this tremendous return. Well, you probably should have gotten out of the market's way there. And then maybe even back here, you should have gotten out of the market's way. And again, he who fights and runs away lives the fight another day. Now, Mr. Dotery's point is that sooner or later, one of these, one of these little reds is going to turn into something like that. And then that fund manager is going to lose half of your money. And all you have to do is go back to 2009 and look at the mutual funds and 99% or 98%, I forget how many, it's a ridiculous amount, were down the same amount as the market itself. So obviously they employed no money management whatsoever. Now you can see this last run we've been in, which I'll zoom in on in just one second. We had this one little kiss here. And you'll notice that I've had these lines drawn in at 100 and minus 100. Well, I don't remember too many times where we got to minus 100 without bouncing back to the longer term moving average. But you'll notice that on the plus 100, you tend to have a correction when you start getting really high or approaching that 100 days of Dave light. And if you go back in time, you'll see. Many times on the charts, we end up with a correction when that magnitude, not the magnitude, when the number of days, okay, in this case, the number of weeks gets up towards 100. The market tends to correct a little bit. So we did have a little correction earlier this year. And then let me just get my chart finished up here. And you can see, obviously, we've been in this great bull leg since 2016. And, of course, we had the correction that began late last year, and we might still be in that correction. Let's zoom it in. And you can see so far we've had a pretty good run. Again, this is a 50-week moving average. Okay. And then the upside Dave light, even right here, you have a little bit of Dave light. And that continues on 
Intel, what? Recently, you can see we approached 100, nothing guaranteed in that, but it does tell you that you're getting a little frothy in that cycle. And then we corrected back to the moving average. When you intersect the moving average, this gets reset back to zero, and then the count starts again. And you can see we've had upside Dave Light since eh, about March, okay? So one, two, one, two, three. The last three months we've had upside Dave Light. I still call it Daylight. Dave Light. And that last correction again was back in March. Now let's take a look at the Russell 2000. As you can see, the 10 day simple, these are the bow tie moving average, the 20 day exponential, and the 30 day exponential moving averages have begun to turn down. If you watch, and I think this is even in the free videos for trading full circle, you'll see that I learned from Greg Morris that as soon as the close goes below the moving average, the exponential moving average, any exponential moving average, no matter how long it is, the exponential moving average will turn down. You have to really squint your eyes, but you can see this 30-day exponential did turn down. A little bit more obvious in the 20-day exponential. So that's why I like the bow ties, is they catch up the prices, those exponential moving averages, fairly quickly. I do like the 10-day moving average, the 10-day simple, mixed in with these two because it gives you a true representation of the average price. But when you get to the 20, which would be roughly one month worth of trading, and the 30, which is roughly 30 days, which is 30 days, which is roughly six weeks worth of trading, I like those exponential moving averages. And by accident, I discovered the reaction or the interaction between the exponential and that 10-day simple can be quite nice. Now, if you notice with the Russell, we've had a pretty good run in here, very persistent run. And if you draw a line through as many bars as possible, mathematically, again, that's equivalent, or math, I didn't say it yet today, but mathematically, as I often say, that's equivalent to linear regression. You can see you can almost intersect nearly every bar. The ones that you can't intersect are above the line, so that counts as being even more bullish. And then so far, we've only pulled back. Now, as I've said before, when in doubt, take the chart out. And what do we have? Well, you can see this is the leg higher in the Russell. This is the pullback. And this was the breakout past the prior peaks. So, so far, now check back often, but so far, Russell 2000 looks pretty good. NASDAQ, eh, not quite as good. You can see, again, Moving averages, the bow tie moving averages have begun to move down. What's a little concerning is that's off of all time highs. You want to pay attention to transitional patterns when they occur off of all time highs. And like the Russell, it's had a pretty good run higher. Unfortunately, it's pulled back below its prior breakout levels. When in doubt, what? Take the chart out, and you can see we had a nice breakout, and then we've come all the way back in below those breakout areas. So I'm not too excited about the NASDAQ. I don't think it's the end of the world, but I think it's going to pay to pay attention here. And we're going to look at all the major MIGs in just one second. Before we do that, I want to show you what I've been up to. One of the reasons I've been a little aloof in addition to some – things in my personal life, which I, I keep say, threatening to write it now. I'll, I'll explain that soon. But one way of coping with all these things is through building this member's website. And as I've said ad nauseum, somebody once told me, you've got a ton of great content. Why do you hide it? It's almost like he felt like I was going out of my way to hide the content. And that's not my intent. It's just the way it is. So what I have begun doing is parsing out everything into courses and turning them into the learning management system. So if you come here to the courses, you'll see up here there's the premium courses, and down here are the members courses. And one thing that's taking forever is I have so much content to go in all these courses, it's taking me forever to parse it out. So what's the big deal? 
a lot of the content you've probably already heard or you know you could find it if you dig long enough. Well, the big deal is, let's say we go into like the methodology, you'll see that you're able to track your course progress, okay? And then each one of these is divided into many bite-sized chunks. So you might not have an hour and a half to sit through an entire Dave Landry's The Week of Charts and then bargain line from Greg Morris. You might end up in trouble if you try to operate heavy machinery afterwards. But you might be able to spend 5, 10 minutes or 15 minutes on a lesson, get the gist of what's going on, take the test, and then move on. And this is all coming from a lot of studying of learning management systems, what works and what doesn't. So I'm very proud of this. Now, I know I'm becoming a nerd, but I think it's really going to help. I woke up at 3 a.m. with carpal tunnel. I have carpal tunnel pretty bad in both my hands. And I woke up and I wouldn't say excruciating pain, but enough pain to where I couldn't sleep for a couple hours. And that's in part from answering all these emails from everyone. And I went back when I did layman's and I looked at, started looking at some of the emails and I counted 30,000 emails that I'd sent over the prior years. And I stopped counting there because I figured the number would be just ridiculous now, probably in the six figures. But the reason I'm doing this is not so I could hopefully heal up my carpal tunnel, but when I reply to an email, that does one person a little bit of good and then they still might not even get it. But with this learning management system, let's say you email me and say, hey, Dave, I'm having some trouble with money management. It's like, well, let's look at your money management course progress. Oh, you really hadn't gotten too far into money management. Maybe if you finish the money management course, you might begin to get it. Now, let's say you're in methodology and you see this methodology is nearly complete and you're missing some points. It's like, OK, well. Ask those questions in the next Q&A session so everybody can benefit. And if that is not within that methodology section, what I will do is I'll go out and make a new lesson on that. So this is going to be a fluid thing, and it's going to constantly be growing. There's no way I have a self-imposed deadline of when I have this launch within the next 40 days. There's no way in 40 days I could get all the content that I have to go into this. So it's going to constantly grow. And if anything is missing, if you guys discover anything that's missing or I might have looked, overlooked something, then it will be added in. And that's the beauty of a learning management system. I know I've told the story quite a bit, but one guy would send me tons and tons of emails. And I'd answer them every day, every day, every day, every day. Finally, 10 years into this process, I'm thinking this guy is mentally challenged. And I was like, just go back and read the first chapter of the first book. These questions you're asking me, you should, you should understand that by now. And he was actually putting his hard-earned money into the markets. Well, and he told me, he's like, well, I've been meaning to get that book. So he never even bothered to read a book. He was learning directly from me this whole time. Now, not that it would cut somebody like that off, but the point is, if we have a learning management system in place, we could figure out where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, and go from there. Now, you notice on here what I'm adding in. Obviously, in addition to the trading courses, there's going to be some bonus content that can be unlocked as you stay with the system. And then that's going to be some premium courses, some consulting time, and some 911 calls. The 911 calls or let's say you are you have a question that's not a general question, but you're in a position and you're not sure what to do. Now, legally, I cannot give you direct trading advice, but what I can do is say, well, let's look at your plan. Let's look at what you intended to do, and let's figure out why you're not following your plan. And when you click on this area here, you'll get direct access to me. And I don't know what that's going to look like. I'm going to be moving soon, but it could be Skype, could be a cell phone, or it could be ideally a web meeting where we get together and we're able to look at the charts and walk through the situation. The other thing that I'm going to have is as you stay with the membership program, you'll 
grow in credits for consultations. And these consultations, the way to do that would be schedule them with me and then we'll do a web meeting to where we could share screens and charts and figure out what may be going on. I think through all these interactions, a lot of this can become, again, part of that learning management system and those courses will continue to grow. Anyway, I am a nerd, but I'm really excited about this. And I really think that I have something special here. And again, under the bonus content, as you stay with it, the first month you get the first three books of mine for free. And then I begin to unlock the premium courses with time. Speaking of premium courses, trading full circle, if you want to start watching those videos, you'll see some of that moving average stuff I talked about earlier. And just go to this kind of a stupid Earl, but 2 trade stock successfully, daylander.com. And the other thing is, right before I went live, I decided to put trading full circle on sale. So it's $300 off right now, which is half the normal price. Now let's get to the live charts. If you guys and girls want to start asking about individual stocks, Feel free to do so now. But as I said a minute ago, I want to look at those major MIGs real quick. And then we'll take a look at your individual stock. So whenever the market begins to look a little iffy, by MIGs, I mean Morningstar Industry Groups. And I've been really happy with these Morningstar Industry Groups as far as helping me in my sector analysis. There's 249 of them. And when the market gets a little iffy, sometimes you can just look at the major groups, which is there's about, oh, I guess about 34 of them or 30 of them or so to get a feel for what's going on. So let's just look real quick. There's chemicals, as you can see, wide and loose and sideways, energies, Headed mostly lower as of late, a little bit of a bounce recently, but looking a little questionable. Metals and mining. So, so far, all of these are big cap areas, conglomerates, not looking so hot. Consumer durables, just kind of sideways at best. Non-durables, eh, not too bad, but kind of looks like the S&P itself. Tried to break out, came right back in. Automotive, not so hot. Food and beverage, kind of sideways. Banking, absolutely abysmal as of late. Well, in general, that's another big cap area. So that's reflective with reflecting what's going on in the overall market. For our financials, I prefer to look at the XLF just because the financials reflects a lot of mutual funds. And you can see that the financials in general have kind of broken down to brand new lows. They're looking dubious at best. Insurance, which is also somewhat financial related, Banging out new lows in here today, notwithstanding. Real estate looking okay, actually. And maybe that's because bonds have improved as of late. Bonds up, what? Rates down, okay? Inverse relationship, obviously, with bonds. And the good news is, so far, those major lows have held in bonds. I know a lot of people out there are very bearish on bonds, meaning they think rates are going up. But fortunately, so far, we've backed off and the rates and bonds have rallied higher. Now, as you go through some of these other areas, especially these big cap areas like manufacturing, banging out new lows, material constructions, and that's where that Pulte trade come from. You can see this is where we got the stop was hit, mechanically stopped out of that. Leisure, not looking so good. Media, eh, not too bad. Retail was looking much better than the other areas. Today it got whacked a little bit, as you can see. It looks like it's trying to come out. So retail looks okay. And then a couple of other ones in here. Let me just point them out. Uh, diversified services. It recently broke out coming back in. Transports is what I wanted to show you. Looking pretty ugly in here. Begging out new lows after stalling short. Uh, brand new highs. Hardware has come back in. This is no big shocker. This is kind of like the NASDAQ itself. Software has come back in, looks a little bit stronger than hardware. Not the end of the world here yet, but it does look questionable. Semi's not looking so hot, recently broke out, came back in. Telecom down here towards these multi-year lows. Internet recently kind of broke out, came back in, sort of like the NASDAQ. And then finally, 
Utilities actually doing okay because what? Bonds are doing okay. Utilities are interest rate sensitive. So the point is the major MIGs, the major sectors are looking a little questionable in here, but it's not the end of the world. I would sit tight mostly for now, let the database tell you what to do. As I've been saying lately, especially in weeks prior, the only thing that's really been worthwhile has been, for the most part, IPOs. All right, Donald says, Billy stopped out on a second, have my position. Do you think the current pullback is too deep to consider getting back in? Uh, Billy is actually a setup for today in the service. Um, so my answer to that is no. I tend to make an exception. The IP, trading IPOs is a little bit different than the core methodology, but it does have more similarities with the core methodologies than differences. I do like deep pullbacks in stocks in general, especially when they've had a really good run like this one here, Billy. But with IPOs, I'm actually a little bit more lenient. And there's not enough time to get into today, but sometimes these IPOs take off and they have this really deep correction. So in answer to your question, I would say no. Uh, Billy is actually a new setup, even though it stopped out, uh, scratched out. It still looks like it has potential. Okay, RTN. RTN. Okay, uh, Linda, what do you want to do with that? Okay, as a trend follower... It's head, it looks like it's headed lower. If anything, you had a first thrust down. Remember, if you guys go back a few weeks, I was very bearish on these on these uh, defense stocks, he tried to say. And you also had a f uh, bow tie back here. Now, it has a bit of route straight lower, but you can see that you did have the signals. took it a little while to get started. So I would leave that alone, maybe short it on bounces. You certainly don't want to buy it because it's low. It's a bad idea. Oh, good point. Um, who's pointing that out? I can't see your name, but uh, let's take a look at that. So, Mr. Anonymous is pointing out that the hourly chart on the NASDAQ has bow tied down. What does that mean? Well, you have to be a little careful here, but if a market is going to turn on the daily it's going to turn on the hourly first now you got to be a little careful with the noise but when it's coming off all-time highs it's worth looking at and this is essentially my how i trade forex i look for major highs and major lows and then I look to try to get in on something like a bow tie off the hourly chart the australian dollar i failed miserably last week early this week on a trade there but I think it might be worth a shot on the next bow tie up. That would be an example of a market that's making multi-year lows and beginning to possibly turn up from those lows. But you can see beautiful bow tie down, almost textbook in nature, on the NASDAQ. Thanks for pointing that out. Let's take a look at the spiders, but let's go way back in time. And remember that slide we had, well, you can see the most recent slide. We got a bow tie here. But I think, where's that slide we had a long time ago? Might not be, might not show up on the hourly. Um, anyway, the point is, if you go all the way back to this slide from this peak on the hourly chart, there was a bow tie down. So, yeah, markets will turn on the hourly first. You just have to be careful not to get too caught up in the noise. What I would recommend, if you are going to trade an hourly chart, do it as a position trade you can get on the hourly but try to hold on longer term okay take a bigger picture view and what you're trying to do when you're getting in those hourly charts in these efficient markets is do it off of major highs or major lows that way the most amount of people will be on the wrong side of the market or certainly have the wrong opinion about the market all right it's howard okay howard good uh, good observation thanks for pointing out yeah, Howard, that one you're asking about, I'm sorry, Donald, the one you're asking about now is on the service for today, so good good job on that. I have a leap into 2020. Oh, you got a leap into 2020 on the RTN? Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, it just doesn't look good right now. I don't know what you were, where you bought it. 
and what your intention was. I mean, if you bought it way back here in 2015 or something, then you're probably doing okay. I'm just looking at it from my methodology and I'm looking at it from my standpoint and it's headed lower off of all time highs. Let's take a look at weekly or multi-year highs. Yeah, all time highs, I think. So that would have me a little concerned, okay? Now, much, much longer term, you might still be okay, all right? Uh, put in your, put in a 50-week moving average like we did earlier. 50-week simple for this. And you can see, yeah, you just, you don't even have downside daylight yet, but that daylight has been reset to zero. So even on a weekly, it's starting to look a little questionable in here. So don't let me screw up your trading. I'm just pointing out what I'm seeing, and it looks kind of ugly. CLPS. Yeah, this looks okay. It's a little extreme in this move higher, so I'd have to analyze it after the pullback. I'd also have to work a little bit to see what the volume is. Volume a little thin today. But in a case like this, I'd like to see a really deep retracement. This doesn't look like enough knockout move to me. So this one might be a little too crazy, but... We'll, uh, we'll take a look at it when it pulls back a little more. Oh, you're welcome, Linda. Ironically, I've been working with two Lindas lately, one, one with a Y and one with an I. Um, what I hate about this stock, or what I'm not crazy about, I should say, hate such a mean word, is that most of this move was just this one big update here. I'd rather see a market kind of take off like this kind of take off like this and then accelerate higher or just at least have quite a few days where it's moving higher as opposed to just one big breakout day. And we've already pulled all the way back to its breakout. So I would pass on that. It just lo looks a little bit crazy to me. Okay, we covered that one. PVTL. Uh, this one looks okay. I think it's on my list for today. It's kind of taken off. It's got a fairly deep pullback. I'd actually see, like to see a tiny bit more, but it looks okay. Okay, it's certainly not bad. So I'll give you um, just short of a high five on that. It's close to a high five. Yeah, we covered that one, Donald. C L P S. We covered that one. All right, any more? I do have a schedule to keep, but I can hang around for a few minutes if you guys have any more or girls. All right, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to be here. Anything in the answer, daviddavelander.com. Keep an eye out for that learning management system coming to a computer near you soon or a cell phone. Anyway, uh, thank you guys and girls. I appreciate you taking time on busy schedule. And everybody, enjoy your weekend. Is it 4th of July next week? I don't think I'll do a show next week. So happy 4th of July for those in the States and happy Wednesday for everyone who is not. Thank you so much.